So we're following up our last piece on how to make sense of the pandemic with a piece based on building resilience. Uh, how do we respond both individually and as groups? What are the anti-fragile and resilient communities around the world? We're going to talk to a few people who are doing really good work, provide some links and offer some tips for ways of kind of getting through. We've got the medical crisis, which is huge and potentially enormous. We've got a financial crisis that's growing. We've got the the crisis of like the emotional crisis and this sort of sense that all of us have that everything's changing at such such a speed and I think we'll return in the future to sort of some of the deeper systemic things that we've been talking about on the channel a lot but right now I think the the, the, the right thing to do is to focus on what we can do individually and what we can do collectively. There is a silver lining in it as well, which is that I've, I've really noticed a lot of people saying that they feel like they're being called to, to step up in some way. I think a lot of the people we've had on the channel have been talking about these sort of deeper systemic issues and intuiting that something like this was likely to happen. Or if something like this did happen, that our systems were no longer resilient enough to, to actually kind of cope. And this crisis will stress test all of them and it'll last a, a, a long time. So I caught up with someone we had on the channel quite a lot, uh, Jamie Wheel, earlier on today. And we did a workshop with Jamie in London last October that was called Collective Sensemaking in an Age of Existential Risk. It's coming anyway, right? Your vortex is about to be overwhelmed by a tsunami. So this is, Lao, this is Sun Tzu, better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. So we're still in our gardens, we're blessed. For now, amen, right? Train. It was originally only available to members, but we're gonna make that available now to everyone and put it up on the site. And I caught up with Jamie on Zoom earlier today. Jamie, so you did a workshop with us fairly recently and we'll put that out as well around sense making in a time of existential risk, mm -hmm. which seems at the time when, when you did it, I did kind of think, well, is Jamie going a little bit over the top? But now I don't think that anymore. What, what should people be preparing for first? Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is, is you know, a massive great to be determined. Um, but in the sense of, you know, if you put it on a kind of an X, Y axis, there's sort of likelihood of something happening and severity of something happening. So if it's likely but not severe, don't worry about it, fairly much business as usual. Um, but if it's unlikely but very severe, you probably want to look after it, and that's fire, fire alarms in the house right? That's home insurance. That's all those kinds of things, which is if it's, it's a rare event, but it's catastrophic and it happens, better to be buffered against it. And if it's likely and potentially severe, you sure as hell want to keep your eye on it. So there's kind of that grid work and it's not all sort of, it's not logical or linear. So you sort of want to be doing both. Um, another way to think of it is sort of Pareto preparedness which is what is the 20% of the actions you can take that cover 80% of immediate contingencies. And that's very straightforward. You can look at NGOs doing aid work in refugee camps or any kind of disaster areas. You can look at, um, you know, camping to mountaineering as sort of a spectrum of just what does resilient self-sufficiency look like as just humans on the earth. And we basically need um, access to clean water, drinkable. You know, um, we need food security we need the ability to sleep warm and dry right or near as damn it we need sustainable durable communication ability and right now that's the internet um, and but it could also be um, local uh, app based connections that can work off cell towers it can be way back in the day you know it's am fm and weather radios little hand crank things that still let me get you know, the, the BBC one, you know, voice of America kind of thing. Um, and, and then some form of medical supplies that allow me or mine to be, um, basically avoiding, um, anything that would be, um, a, you know, life saving and, and health preserving. Um, but then also avoiding cluttering emergency medical systems and health systems that are going to be absolutely at capacity. So go down those checklists, um, see what available 
basically cash and resources you have. Uh, consider leveraging credit now that you might not normally, if you're sort of fiscally conservative and like to pay as you go, now's the time to make the most of your credit card limits um, and avoid black market pricing spikes or just you know inability to secure things. And make sure that your core family unit is in a safe, stable spot. And if it, cause, because if it is, then you're already ahead of a lot of less fortunate folks. And once you can do that, then you can expand your sphere of concern to your Dunbar community and be of more use and more service. So start with that. And, and there's no need to be you know, stuck with the notion of um, overreacting would be embarrassing. Or if I did that kind of thing, would I be that sort of a person? You know, far better to act, I mean, basically, in considering what we're facing right now. Um, if you take on too much of it, it can collapse you into despair. If you don't like how that feels, few of us do. The other temptation is to go back to denial, minimization, dismissal. Um, and, and neither of those is a, is a resourceful state. So what you want to do is you want to cl claim the center, which is deliberate and decide. So think clearly and then act clearly and separate your emotions from your deliberations and your decisions. If you're not used to thinking in emergent environments, crisis situations, life and death situations, a lot of this is really overwhelming. But just breathe and take the right actions early. Worst case scenario is you prepared and you can give it back to someone who didn't. Best case scenario is you actually needed it. And you're really grateful you did when you did. I remember in the, the talk that you gave, you talked about that the biggest difference between survival was people who recognized the danger early and reacted and responded appropriately. Yeah, I mean, we're massively socially conditioned creatures of habit. And, you know, the old Oscar Wilde joke of it's, you know, it's, it's every Englishman's solitary goal to make it to the grave unembarrassed. <laughs> like things like that um, and habit and you know people often talk about fight flight um, which rhymes so it's memorable but it's wrong that, that's not that's not the cascade the cascade is first freeze then flee and then an entirely different activation circuit is fight so as little rodents as little mammals etc our first move is just get small and do nothing then run, panic and run for your fucking life. And only after that, if, if neither of those options is available and you're still there, then there's activation energy and there's a move to actually do something. So we need to identify the freeze, flee impulses, move through them and get to not fight, but act with energy early. So a few of the people I've been speaking to over the last couple of days are talking about how to create kind of resilient communities and support. And I think a lot of people are in that place. What can people do to do that, to kind of support each of people around them and to, to kind of create more anti-fragile communities? Yeah. And I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing that globally right now, which is really encouraging and uplifting. Um, and, you know, Jordan Hall, our, our friend and colleague that's here on Rebel Wisdom quite a bit, you know, often refers to it as uh, SOCI or SOCI, you know, like self-organizing collective intelligence. And we're seeing lots of that on the highly credentialed epidemiological level. So we're been, we've been helping coordinate uh, in, uh, interact in, interactions between Stanford, Harvard, MIT Media Labs, hackathons, lots of people doing both redundant and complementary activities, public health and, and, and research. Um, so that's happening at those levels, um, and it's fantastic, as well as messaging into executive branch policy to the extent that we possibly can. Um, and then there's also just grassroots bottom up, which is first get to higher ground. Secure yourself in a way that is sustainable so that you can be part of the solution and not, an, and not another casualty that needs someone else looking after you. So first do that and make no bones about it. Once you've got that sorted, the very natural human impulse is who else needs help and how can I help? And what we're seeing, uh, there's a couple of things. Um, in, in telehelp, 
uh, which is now a Facebook group. It was started, you know, less than a week ago as of this recording, um, has bloomed and now has basically combinations of people with resources who are saying, I can give, and here's my town and country and state. And then people who are saying, ask, I have a need. And this is no, no solicitations, just food and food, clothing, medications, basics, and people are doing this. And it's explicitly apolitical. It originated here in Austin, Texas by a friend of ours. It's going national and, and international as we speak. Um, and it's very specific because it's saying, we are all neighbors. We are all patriots of whatever flag we're flying. This is the time to act from our, from our better angels. And the response is profound and interestingly, highly self-organized. This was our mate's idea. He did a recording four or five days ago. It is scaling to complete strangers and now has 53 units, which represent the states and the you know BVIs and Puerto Rico and that kind of stuff, and is becoming self-organizing. So who knows? This is dynamic subordination, which is who knows what to do next is in charge. So that is a profound example, and hopefully we'll get modeled in a hundred thousand different ways uh, as people understand this is how we need to do it. And no one's trying to hold the wheel. There's not bottlenecks. There's clear community enforcement of this is what we are and this is what we're not. Um, but once those parameters are in place, allowing humans to do good things is critical. So Jamie talked about a few practical things, including the IntelliHelp group that's just been set up. So we're going to put a link to that below and a link to a few of the other resources that Jamie mentioned. So one thing that seems clear is that people are responding to the crisis in very different ways. So some people are, are feeling that it's very stressful, they're retreating, and it is very stressful, but a lot of other people are, at the same time, kind of increasing their agency, being more active, wanting to get involved in things, and feeling this sort of singular point of focus. And that was, we had a group call last night with, I think there may be 25 people on it, a uh, members call, and that, that energy was... You know, there was mixed, but there was certainly an energy with lots of um, forward momentum and focus and intention. So we recorded with Diane Mitchell Hamilton yesterday, who is a really superstar Zen teacher and mediator, uh, recording for our online course that we're running. She's one of the faculty on the online course. Uh, but it seemed a really good opportunity to ask her about this. Like, how do we take care of ourselves? How do we, how do we understand kind of the neuroscience of fear of contagious fear and how do we kind of resource ourselves in the middle of this one of the reasons that fear is so contagious is again just our evolutionary history so we have a very powerful uh, sensing system for for threat and we refer to that as fight or flight and it comes from the oldest part of the brain the reptilian brain but the midbrain the mammalian brain is also responsible for uh, limbic resonance, meaning that felt experience we have when we walk into a room and it's celebrative and we immediately feel happier. We walk into a room that's tense and suddenly we find ourselves gripped or, or the way in which we pick up fear just simply by reading or listening to others. There's fear in the space and therefore it's part of, it's, it's partly, it, it communicates directly into our system and it bypasses cognition. So in order to work with it, we actually have to be able to notice it and be able to label it as fear or anxiety. In my mind, I make a distinction between fear and anxiety. Fear, there is usually an object. I'm afraid of there not being any supplies in the grocery stores, right? And anxiety is objectless. There's an uncertain future. There's a not knowing um, to some degree anxiety is free-floating, you could say, where, where fear is quite specific. And so in order to work with that, we first have to be able to notice it in the body, what the sensations of fear are. And, you know, they correlate to stress hormones. So there's often um, a rushing sensation in the limbs. There's a rushing sensation in the body. There can be a nausea or a sort of pit in the stomach. Um, there can be clenching in the throat. There can be hunched up shoulders and a contracted jaw, I mean contracted neck. Um, generally there's contraction because when we contract, we're being poised to be able to move, right? So if we're afraid, we contract in order for this explosive movement. So often there's a sense of contraction. We might feel uh, cold and we notice that the mind is rushing a lot. And there's usually a flurry of thoughts because we're trying to strategize what to do. So when we become aware of all these, these uh, symptoms, if you will, of fear, then we can just label it really directly as fear. And then what is the response to having a lot of fear in the body? 
Well, uh, the response to having fear in the body if, is first of all to notice the kinds of thoughts that are happening and mostly they're related to the future. So just slow the mind down and bring one's attention into the here and now. And even when the mind is slowed and quieted, the sensations in the body will persist. There'll still be the rushing sensations, the need to move, the feeling of a slight amount of nausea, there's tension. And just to sit quietly and include those sensations. Any more tips for dealing with the, the inner conflict that maybe people are feeling at the moment? Yeah, just being in the here and now and using the breath and then being in conversation, and here's a really, really important point that I would offer everyone, is make it a discipline in the conversation to talk about what you're upset by, what is challenging, what is fear-inducing, and then when you've done that, to make sure that in your conversations you return to a positive view and reflect on all the goodness that's happening right now. What are all the things that you're seeing people do for one another? What are the ways in which people have extended care to you, or concern, or kindness? And just be sure that we don't let the negativity bias of our evolution take over our perception. Because, as I said before, Mr. Rogers' mother said, always look for the helpers. It's extremely supportive. Human beings know how to come together under crisis. And this is actually wonderful, and it's not wonderful. It's, it's wonder, what's wonderful is that we're so connected and that we're sharing such a similar experience. So just to pick up off some of the things Diane was talking about, about the importance of our inner resilience, we're going to be recording a whole film around that and going into a lot more detail around some of the practices that we found useful. We're going to be releasing publicly some of the practices we've designed for the online course because we feel they're very important right now and just delving into, um, just on a really practical level, what can we do to increase our resilience internally as individuals? So we also caught up with Rich Bartlett, who wrote a piece that went kind of viral recently about community building and how to create anti-fragile relationships. And he's a New Zealander, he lives in Italy at the moment, so he's in lockdown himself, trying to think about how to turn some of the tips and tools that he's worked on, which are kind of mostly for in-person, into an online manual for community building. Yeah, Rich, you, you wrote this really amazing piece that went kind of viral about creating resilient small communities, creating what you've called micro-solidarity. Can you talk about like, some of the principles for that? What, what are sort of some of the tools, some of the ideas that people can take away, especially now that we're all like, needing sort of more resilience and, and needing to kind of build anti-fragile communities and connections? Maybe one of the first parts is this idea of courage. Like, what is courage for and, and, and where do we get it from? Um, my sense is that we are facing really significant threats um, and huge uncertainty. And the way that you hold up to that and show up to that and stay with the trouble is uh, with a huge amount of courage. And um, where do you get courage from? I think you get it from encouragement. I think it's a social process that people um, contribute to each other, that we uh, animate each other's, uh, we contribute to each other's courage account by encouraging each other. And courage means to persist without the guarantee of a positive outcome, you know, like to just keep showing up, keep standing up, keep doing the thing that needs to be done. I think that's a social phenomenon. And I think the other part is um, meaning. Like where does meaning come from? For me, meaning is a social phenomenon as well. Like the way that I understand what's happening is there's a phenomenon and then there are my peers who I'm close to, people who I know really well, and I see how am I reacting to this phenomenon and how are my peers reacting and, and do some kind of mental mathematics to, to, to construct a picture, like what does this thing mean if, if these 10 different people are having these 10 different reactions? Where do I sort of position myself? I think that's a social phenomenon. And having really um, high bandwidth connections with people helps me to feel grounded and like I know... Um, I know what's going on in the world because I've bounced the signal off these 10 reflectors that I know and trust and I understand kind of what biases they're each bringing. So that's kind of the um, why. Uh, why I want a methodology is, is, is for those two pieces. And then the, the structure of it is like that we've been trained for individualism and, and it's really um, it's severely undermining our resilience. And that the answers that we need involve us 
developing relational competence, learning how to be in groups. And um, as, I, as I said, I've been traveling with my partner for a few years, working with groups, working with collaborative groups, decentralized groups, non-hierarchical groups. And what we realized from working with more than a thousand of these different uh, collectives and companies and so on, is people are really bad at collaboration. They're really, really bad at it. And it's because they were raised wrong and they weren't trained. You know, they weren't trained for the work. And, and so like, Micro solidarity is a set of methodologies to train people in how to be a group. And so it's micro solidarity is kind of like some artificial architecture to recreate that social fabric, which um, uh, you would hope would kind of arise spontaneously between people. But I think we need some prosthetics to, to help us recreate it or for some people to recreate it for the first time. Um, probably, probably one of the essential pieces uh, of the theory to, to just have in mind is my language. And I'm not attached to the language. Other people can use their own terminology. But I talk about dyads, so that's two people. And then I talk about a crew, which is somewhere between like three and eight people. I limit it to how many people you can have dinner with, like in a, sit in a, in a circle with at a small table. Um, and then I named the congregation, which is basically limited by Dunbar's number. So like one or 200 people, you know, so like a group that's small enough where everyone can know everyone. Um, and then beyond the congregation, I say any group bigger than that, I just call that a crowd because once you get beyond that number, the majority of people are strangers to each other. The proposal is we need more congregations. And, um, and what's the point of a congregation? It's to find your crew. It's to find your small group of people that are going to, really go through the hard times with you and hold you up and support you. Probably the highest leverage thing that everyone can do, the sort of like top tip, is um, in a small group of people, make a small commitment. So like I said, find three people and say, we're going to meet four times over the next week, you know, each week for four weeks. And we're just going to talk to each other for an hour. And this is, you know, some very vague idea about why and what sort of principles we have. And at the end, having done that four, four times, on the fifth time, we're going to stop and reflect. That's the thing that makes all the difference. Stop and reflect and say, okay, so we met four times. What did you like about it? What was really good? What was not so good? What could be done differently? And getting in this habit of collective reflection and collective self-awareness and saying, okay, we did a little something. We tried something. Did it help? Did, we, did, we, you, know, did you feel more connected, more sane, uh, more ambitious, more courageous? Um, and what, what do we need? And we'll put a link to some of Rich's writings and resources below in the show notes. So in the first film we put out a couple of days ago, Joe Edelman of Human Systems mentioned a few communities around the world that he thought was doing really good work, and a few names of people that he thought were creating good anti-fragile communities, ones that are actually being sort of getting stronger under the stress rather than getting weaker. And one of the people he mentioned was a woman called Sarah Ness, who's based in Austin. So yeah, what I found really interesting about the community that she's part of and what she's doing is it's really based around a lot of the relational practices that we've talked about on the channel. We've talked about circling, we've talked about inquiry, we've talked about uh, authentic relating before, and she's really central to a lot of those communities. And those kind of practices seem to be really important for building resilience and, and like tight social bonds that within these sort of times of crisis really come to the fore. So I caught up with her and talked about that yesterday. With everything that's going on, I think it's really important to look at which communities are kind of show, self-organizing and building resilience and which ones aren't. And he mentioned you as someone that he thought was doing really, really good work. Can you talk about what, uh, what kind of work you're doing around this or what work you've done around resilient community? Yeah. Um, I just want to say it's really cool to have community starting to come up as what feels like a more kind of relevant topic as we're transitioning most things online, because it's like, this is what we've got right now is how do we support each other? And I've been working in the authentic relating and circling movement for the last eight years. And I got into it because I was um, interested in the housing cooperative movement. And I was trying to figure out like, how is it that people can coexist and support each other's needs in these kind of smaller, um, tribes really, or like conglomerates that don't just rely on government or on work or on other people or on school to provide our social networks. Cause after we graduate from school, there's not a lot of ways to 
form connections if you don't have a church or kind of a dedicated social organization. And so I got obsessed with building these spaces that were focused on a form of communication and connection, like often relational games, um, like expanded icebreakers almost, that gave people a space to just really quickly get honest with each other about like who we are, what we want, what's important to us. And something I found that's been really cool is transitioning to like the wider global network of the more than 80 communities that are around the world. It's like people will come through the community, learn a practice of communication, take it, and then like form a hub with the people that are close in their life or with others that they found in that. And it's like, it almost has become this pass through where it's like, okay, come in, learn skill, connect with people, go out, form tribe. And as the COVID epidemic has ramped up, like there's so many people sharing information with each other, creating events with each other. Just yesterday, I was on a call with um, all the different uh, creators of, of different uh, online connection platforms. We actually had a couple people from Human Systems, this platform Listenly that does listening, Circle Anywhere and Connect that do authentic relating and circling online. And each of these has online activities in many cases every day or multiple times a day and we were all coming together and going okay can we can we create like an emergency support network for first line providers we've got you know 10 people on this call they're all going yeah like we'll divide up different pieces of this we can give facilitators we can rally hundreds of people at a go that have these space holding skills that then can translate out into different communities great i mean that's a really good example of a, of a real world um operation or real world project. Can you give any other examples of those real world projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's another, I've been drawing some inspiration from the Bay Area rationalist communities that have beautiful, they've been doing a lot of coordination, especially around like gathering supplies and having common hubs for it. And then um, they put together this spreadsheet of uh, houses in the Bay Area. And for each house, it has like a quarantine level and you know who's in the house, um, and I created a version of that for my communities, which is like quarantine level, but then also needs and capacities. So what is it that you're needing? Because there are some people in our community that are immunocompromised and can't go out or are older. So, you know, do you need food? Do you need money? Whatever it is, what are your capacities? What can you give? And we have like a, a thread of people that are, that are communicating on that and that are updating. Something I have found I was, I was thinking a little bit this morning about this call and what is it that creates community. Um, there's this cool intersection where I often am like, well, I can just like create a resource and put it out to people. Like here's this amazing spreadsheet. And something that I love about the practices that I've been engaged with um, over time is there's focus on group connection, but there's also a lot of focus on one-on-one -on -one connection and community feels only as strong as the strength of the individual connections. Like people do, what their friends are doing, they do what their close groups are doing. So there's also a lot of just informal checking in that's happening. Like, hey, how are you doing? What do you need? Um, is anybody caring for this person or that person? And this is something that Joe Edelman spoke about in the conversation I had with him, that actual cultural change or actual systemic change comes from exactly crises like this, where we create kind of local solutions to problems that actually do things better than maybe can be done cent centrally. Do you get that right. sense that that's happen starting to happen? Yeah. And it's, it's a cool loop back to like the communities that I'm part of authentic relating and circling are kind of rare in that there's never been a governing or organizing board. There's now starting to be kind of intimations of that, but every community has invented and iterated its own way of doing things invented its own governance systems, invented its own games. The games manual, the authentic relating games manual that's kind of used as the, the resource text for these communities is created by putting out a call and saying, who's invented games in the last year? Submit them. And so in that sense, I've been privileged to witness like what happens when communities are allowed to really help develop, develop their own facilitation trainings, like their own standards of ethics and codes. And it's been successful and more and more communities have been coming about every year. And I think as we've gotten, as we've grown as a country, so there are so many people as, as a world. So there are so many people that systems of government can no longer address each of our individual needs. Um, 
I think there really has been more very under the radar development of friend pods and community pods and practices where now on the internet, it's really amazing for me to witness how many events are starting to happen that I didn't hear of when they were happening in person, but now that they're online, they're getting announced. It's like online dance parties that were happening every week before in different cities, online authentic relating games and circles, online con conversations, the online meditations and yoga. And there's so many things that people have been doing in small groups that it's, it's really amazing kind of seeing it, seeing it pop up. Like, I think this is really, it's, it's a call to connect, and we're just gonna but it's also an awareness of Michelle the Hamilton. systems that have been being built. And we're just going to give the that final I think word to this, this network across the world and are really what people are depending on to keep them alive. And do you have any more suggestions of resources to share or ideas to share for people to start creating kind of anti-fragile communities in, in their own areas? Yeah, I think one thing is, and a reaction I've often had is I've seen an event pop up or I've seen someone do something and I've been like, okay, well now I can't do that because someone else has done it. Like someone's already holding a Zoom dance party. I don't need to hold my own Zoom dance party. Or someone's already like reached out to you know, my friends, so I don't need to reach out to them. And it's like replicating the wheel right now is not a bad thing. So like, if you have an idea for what to do that could resource even one person around you, like even sending a message to one friend you're wondering about, like before you think that thought of, oh, someone else has probably done it, just pick up your phone and give it a try. Because the worst case is nobody comes and you spend an hour on the internet, like by yourself having your own dance party or that friend doesn't respond and you message three others. I think one of the things that's going to most make us anti-fragile right now is that willingness to just do something, try something, learn something, offer something, mm -hmm. do it to a group and distinguish doing it from a group to doing it from an individual. Cause those are really different feelings to doing it from, to a system. Like what can you do to support the systems around, around you is like another question that I've been asking myself. And then also this practice of if you get reactive, if you get scared, especially if that's in relation to another person, um, so I don't know if that cut up, especially if that's in relation to another person, just see if you can ask a question first. That's the best hack I have. When you notice yourself wanting to react, ask the person a question. Like, why did you say this? What's going on for you? Are you scared? Can I help? And we've talked about sort of a few of these practices, circling, authentic, relating. And if people mm -hmm. watch and maybe want to get involved or experience them, any suggestions there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One actually really good way to be involved is we have an online platform called Connect that has circling and authentic relating multiple times a day, every day. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good place to come if you just want a space where you can slow down, drop in, talk about what's going on. Um, and be held by some really amazing facilitators. All the facilitators on there are pretty highly trained and vetted. And then there's also on that same site, website, Authrev, there's a manual of authentic relating games that you can download that have just a ton of stuff that you can pull out and you can play even one-on-one. -on -one. Like, And I'd suggest um, some really good ones. There's a list of sentence stems, which are just like fun questions to ask. There's a game called the curiosity game and a game called the empathy game and a game called noticing. And those are three of our basics. Noticing is just like going back and forth, sharing like how you feel in the moment. Like I notice I'm like have, you know, um, my throat feels kind of rough or I notice I feel scared. Or I notice like, I'm glad you're here. Curiosity is that, that game of having a couple minutes to just ask questions of someone else. Um, it's really amazing to find questions that you never thought you could ask even of someone that you've known for years and years. There's something special about having a dedicated time. And then empathy is taken directly from nonviolent communication. It's a listening and reflection game that can help clear some of the buildup of emotion that's happening for many of us. So there's a lot of resources for what Sarah was talking about. So the, the manual of all of the authentic relating games is available online. We'll put the link in the show notes. And also the online community around authentic relating are putting on a whole program of different uh, ways of connecting, different uh, events and Zoom calls all through the day. And they're also offering access for free for healthcare workers and healthcare workers' families for the next three months. 
and also just to mention that we have we've been running something called the Wisdom Gym for a little while, uh, led by Peter Limberg, our Toronto correspondent and, and community manager, and we've been kind of trialing a few of those, and we're going to start rolling those out. We're going to basically speed up that program. We were kind of doing uh, testing of them and just seeing what worked, and we're going to start rolling those out in the next few days to kind of watch this space. Uh, those experiments have been going really well. The group calls have been getting more and more depth and more and more presence and more and more, um, yeah, there's a real sort of sense of shared purpose as well coming through in a lot of the people who, and in a lot of the members. So do watch out for that. And just to say as well, if you're new to Rebel Wisdom and you haven't seen many of our films, we've been covering a lot of these kind of broader topics of systemic risk and the shift from one system to another and what that might mean, what that might entail, that I think are becoming increasingly relevant. And we'll return to that topic as well kind of in the future, but for now we've put together a playlist that we're calling the Sense Making Playlist on YouTube. So if you have a look at, the, at our homepage on YouTube, there's a, there's a new playlist there with some of the films that we think are really relevant to kind of understanding some of the deeper issues that are going on in the shifts that we're now kind of being overwhelmed with on a kind of daily basis. So do have a look at that. We're going to continue to release films around the kind of making sense of what's going on on a regular basis. So see you soon. And we're just going to give the final word to Diane Mushel Hamilton. You know, being aware of one's entire context is really, really important. And so if it's important to prepare, to go shopping and prepare, then that's what people should do. Um, it's important to stay in conversation with like-minded people, but particularly connect to people who can maintain both relaxation in the nervous system and also a positive outlook, even while being realistic about the threat. So I think remaining relaxed and positive, even while being realistic, is a really important character trait that we need to seek out. I think websites like yours are extremely important in this time because one can actually self-isolate and stay at home and connect into uh, people who have a big picture vision, who are going to support people in not panicking, who offer practices like sitting meditation. So if you go to Two Arrows Zen, my website, there are two times of the day that you can get on and sit with other people and actually experience a stable relationship to body and mind and open awareness. And so I think the it's just important to engage the situation as practice. In Zen, we say that our life is our practice. So our life right now in our own interior, in relationship to our choices and our behaviors, in relationship to how we mingle and cluster and talk with others, and to how we work with the systems, including the healthcare system, including the economic system, all those things are an important part of the practice. Nothing is left out. It's our entire life. And for someone like me who's been practicing meditation and mediation both for 40 years, I feel like it's time to, to actually this is where the rubber meets the road. All, this, all these years of practice, if I can't manifest some of what I've been taught and learned over this time, when am I going to be able to? So I hope we can, we can use the benefit of our practice and share it with others during this time, is what I'm hoping. Times that we maybe have been practicing for. Yes, I think, I think that under the circumstances that, we, we use that expression, business as usual, there is no business as usual right now. Everybody is in a little bit more or less an alternative universe to the one they were in before. So decision making, conversations, choice making, sense making, everything is altered because of the intensity of not just the threat to you, but the threat to, to everyone around us. So it isn't just that I might get sick, it's that I might be sick, not know it, and infect someone near to me. So it, we're, we're completely connected in this way. and. This is the time to heighten our awareness and actually use the clarity of our mind and the, the openness of our heart to include the well-being of everybody and the efficiency and responsiveness of our body and the tremendous stability of our communication systems, our um, internet, if you will. I mean, there's so many downsides to it, but right now it's actually really, really helpful because we can get information directly, and that's really important. And um, so I think regarding our life as practice is the first thing, and then seeing where are the places that we actually need support. So in relationship to 
how we show up to each other, are there room for multiple perspectives? Is that something that we can create space for? I, I see some things on Facebook where there's this kind of, are people being panicked or are people not, or what's the truth? And my guess is that it's a combination of both and that there's room for fear and there's room to be fearless right now. And is it possible to listen in such a way that you create space for multiple perspectives? Can you calm your own nervous system in relationship to somebody else who's feeling panicked? And you can simply by receiving them, not by comforting them, not by um, giving them advice, but simply by just listening to how they feel and what's happening. That, that's a practice that we've engaged in um, for years. And uh, we all know that when we're in a state of mind that is more in flow, meaning that we're not pressured by time, meaning that we're not coming from an egoic place, meaning that it's a natural responsiveness as opposed to making effort, that we can move in flow and we can execute really um, beautifully, even under stress. And so any practice that creates more flow in my system and creates more flow in relationship to you and relationship to the whole is worth engaging at this time. So all of us are being challenged to bring more of what's possible to this moment. So uh, I would say our kind of casual and unmindful way of being is not the best approach. So mindfulness awareness is the drill right now. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.